Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards, where no ship is safe from being taken down to its nuts and bolts. Well, I would make some sort of expressive, very loud, very uh, uncharacteristic for me introduction for this particular video, but instead I would like you to go ahead and if you hadn't already, go back and take a look at the video that came before this one, because someone did a much better job of introducing this channel than I possibly ever could hope to, and I am very thankful I was able to get them to do that, because wow, what a amazing job that was. That Tyrone, the big man Tyrone, might be the single reason that your species does not get annihilated by some random ass species out there in the void. So congratulations for that, guys. Good job. But seriously, if you need a spokesperson for basically anything, including introducing some half-ass YouTube channel that is just a consummate cosmic joke, consider hiring big man Tyrone. He does an amazing job. Like, no joke. Legitimately. Amazing. Thank you again. And now on with the show. One of the more annoying things about you organic species is that you have this innate, built-in, unavoidable, simply insurmountable sense of impatience. You simply cannot wait to get wherever you're going or do whatever you're doing or there is just no concept of like, shit takes time, get the fuck used to it. But oh no, you have to get somewhere and you have to do something and it has to be right the fuck now. And you're just running around constantly doing stupid shit all the time, and you're just running around, running around, running around, and then suddenly spot you're dead. And I mean, I guess I get it, because you do really lead short, miserable little lives, so you, you do need to run around and get stuff done really fast before splat, you're dead again. And, well, I mean, again, sorry, I get it, but god damn it's annoying. Anyways, the need for speed seems to be just deliberately hard-coded into every organic species in existence. And one of the best examples of the entire concept of I need to get somewhere right the fuck now, even if it's not somewhere I actually want to be, is the entire concept of something called drop pods. And if you cheapskates would eventually pony up a little more once in a while, I might have enough funds laying around to actually buy the license for... It's raining, men! Hallelujah! But I don't, so here we all are listening to that absolutely horrible rendition, and it's all your fault! But, ironically, that chorus for that particular song is basically the entire explanation for the entire notion of drop pods. They are, I assume, ironically shaped like coffins, more or less, frequently, whatever, and they are designed to get Mostly people, although not always just people, from point A, where point A is in orbit, to point B, where point B is on the surface of a given planet, as fast as humanly possible, or organically possible, or whatever. And really, the really fun drop pods actually rely on the cargo inside being wrapped in power armor or something equivalent, and deploy their cargo way above the surface of orbit, and hope the cargo makes it. Yeah. That sounds like an exciting ride. And see, this is the first interesting aspect of drop pods. They are disposable, they are expendable, frequently they don't even make it all the way to the planet. And this is the whole point of them. And this is why you should be very, very concerned about any species that is actually using drop pods in combat. Because they are literally throwing shit away just for the shits and giggles of it. They are that invested in their military that they would rather shoot people down to the planet in coffins, custom-built, highly expensive coffins, than use a shuttle to get them there or a bigger ship to get them there. They are really, really out there to kill you. You should be worried about that. Or, well, honestly, maybe you shouldn't. So, drop pods are complicated, and there's just no way around it, and we're not going to be able to cover all the specific complications and details and holy fuckedness about literally shooting someone out of a capital ship through upper atmosphere, through a lower atmosphere, all the way to the planet, and hoping they survive and hoping they can, like, recover themselves from the impact. I, uh, there's, there's just so much physics involved. It's mostly just guesswork when you go right down to it. But we're going to break this down into two big aspects that even your pathetic human minds can understand. First off, how good is your inertial dampening technology? 
How good is it in general? How small is it? How portable is it? How expendable is it? Because again, drop pods are by design expendable. And inertial dampening hardware determines how hard you can stop someone before they, you know, liquefy. And considering that we are literally shooting a basically oversized bullet from a capital ship all the way to the surface of a planet, that person might be going really fast when they get to the surface of the planet. How good is your initial dampening? Is it good enough to suck up the impact just straight and the person can walk out just fine? Do you have to apply braking? Do you have to apply retro jets? Do you have to use parachutes? Do you have to use drogues? How good is your inertial dampening? And by the way, the existence of quote unquote power armor does not solve you from the basic problem of inertia. Now, technically it does help a little because power armor will help a human organic squishy body to absorb forces a little better, but it won't stop the forces. So you're basically adding a massive, hugely complicated, ridiculously expensive sponge underneath him or around him or whatever you want to say it, and then shooting him down the same bullet all over again. So really, the real significant question is how good are your initial dampeners? Or I guess supposedly how strong are your drop soldiers? Because I could totally see some like optimized, genetically engineered mutants that would be amazing at this particular role, but that's a whole different ball of wax. And the second big detail is how good is your enemy's anti-aircraft system, or specifically their anti-ballistic missile system? Because drop pods aren't exactly aircraft, are they? Aircraft generally throw themselves at the ground and miss. Drop pods' entire purpose of existence is literally throwing themselves at the ground and hitting really hard. Hopefully not that hard. Hopefully not hard enough to kill the crew on board. I mean, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, um, so yeah, how good is your enemy's anti-ballistic missile system? And don't get me wrong, ABM is complicated. There's all kinds of math there. We're not even going to get into that math. I am literally trying to boil this down as simple as I can for y'all because I understand that y'all did not like the massive quantities of math that came by way of the thermodynamics episode we had about X-wings and their radiator rings or the fact that they were not actually radiator rings. So I'm just kind of skipping past all the details right now. Suffice to say that intercepting things that are coming down from orbit is hard. Intercepting things that are coming down from orbit faster than they would be naturally is even harder. Intercepting things that are coming down from orbit faster than they would be normally, that are actively attempting to resist your capabilities of intercepting them, is massively harder. So again, the question becomes, how good is your enemy's concept of orbital defense? Anti-ballistic missile defense? Aircraft defense? Whatever they're doing. I mean, are they literally just pointing their cannons in the air and spray firing by blind vision? Or do they have like an orbital shield that your frickin' drop pods are just going to bounce off of? I mean, I guess those are the two extremes. Yeah, there you go. Work with that. Where, where between those two points does your enemy fall? And those are the two significant variables you need to consider. How good are your inertial dampeners? And how good are your enemy defenses? Because yes... If you can drop hard and fast and ridiculous, you'll probably survive, no matter how good your enemy's defenses are, unless they're like literally the actual shield. And if you have to like start deploying parachutes in the upper atmosphere and start slowing yourself down, well, some fucking rando with a goddamn migratory bird hunting shotgun is probably going to take your guys out on their way down. So congratulations, you failed. But on the other hand, if your intended target's planet's only defenses are literally randos with migratory bird hunting shotguns, then, well, anything works, right? And I know so many of you Humies have difficulty with this concept, but it really is the best analogy to what I'm trying to talk about. And that is to say, let's take a moment and consider the supply-demand curve. Oh my god, the horror! Yeah, so... The first thing to understand about this particular graph is that the intersection point is movable. So let's go ahead and say that the D line is like the efficacy of your enemy's defenses. And the S line is the survivability of your cargo based off the technology level of your inertial dampeners, right? 
And the thing is, the intersection point moves because the lines move. So say you're attacking like a caveman level planet with drop pods, and I have no God bless it idea why you would do that. But hypothetically speaking, if you wanted to do that, the D line would basically be a flat line across the, the bottom axis. There, there would be no D line. It would just be there. So anything you wanted to drop would make it. it, it it's not a big deal. On the other hand, if you're trying to say do an orbital drop on like Starfleet's Earth, I'd imagine the D-line would be a lot higher. And I don't know if they actually had planetary shields for Star Trek. Uh, actually, I don't know if they did or not. Interesting question. I do know that Coruscant in Star Wars did have planetary shields, which was a different problem that occurred in a book that apparently is no longer canon, so fuck it, fuck Disney, fuck whatever. But still, the D-line would be really, really high and really, really flat. Still, again. And so you'd have to have some really obnoxiously high-tech insertion drop pods to get through that shit. But it's the in-between aspects that really in are interesting to me personally as a person who does not give a ever-loving fuck about you goddamn humies dropping yourselves in coffins to a planet. Because no, normally these curves are not flat. In fact, these curves are meant to present probabilities in my abuse of them. Because basically quantity is still correct. Depending on the number of things you drop into a planet, some of them is going to get through. And if you drop more, more is going to get through. And for price, I mean, as you add to the efficacy of the orbital defense system, then yes, fewer things are going to get through. But this is the fascinating linear algebra problem of drop pods. Because yes, that is bizarrely a solvable solution, or at least it's solvable within a certain range. But it's still very, very complicated. And frankly, one of the very best descriptions of how drop pods could possibly work is best saved for one of our later episodes. And now, from a word from our, well, they're not our sponsors. In fact, they're just basically me. So here we go. Good night, said the minion. We are programmed to receive. You can undock any time you like, but you can never leave.